Well, you've probably noticed that there's an incredible amount of confusion and controversy around what it means to be a woman in modern American culture today. A prime example of this came a couple months ago when Judge Katani Brown Jackson was going through the confirmation practice process with the Senate to be one of our nine Supreme Court justices. Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee asked her what, what you think would be a simple question. And she asked her, can you provide a definition for the word woman? This is a very important question because you can't defend what you can't define. In order for women to receive fair and equal treatment, protection in our country, we need to be clear regarding what constitutes a woman. Senator Blackburn referenced Leah Thomas, the transgender swimmer from Penn, you might have seen in the news, who is dominating the women's competition at the NCAA tournaments this year. The question behind Senator Blackburn's question was this, is it fair that someone was born a biological male would be able to compete against and dominate biological women who've been training their entire lives for that moment. It is a big, 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 big deal to be able to make it to the NCAA championships. Uh, I was a competitive swimmer for 14 years. I swam collegiately on scholarship for the University of Kansas, and I can attest that there's an enormous amount of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that goes in to the training process as an athlete. Uh, often was training over 30 hours a week, waking up at four or five in the morning, and then also doing that practice, then doing a practice late at night, running, weight, lifting weights, all of that. And uh, all, that, all that since we are little. And, and there's a massive difference between the sexes in terms of strength, size, and stamina. It's biological. And you look at the records, they're always way faster with the men than the women. So it's completely unfair for biological men to compete against biological women. And you're talking about ruining people's dreams. You get that one chance to step up and compete for a national title, only to have that usurped by someone of a different gender. And you're taking away scholarships and opportunities for women. And so this is just a sport. This is a game. The implications of the definition of women are far more serious. So how does the newest Supreme Court justice, how did she respond to that question? She said, and this is a direct quote, can I provide a definition? No, I can't. Not in this context. I'm not a biologist, end quote. And what she's ultimately saying is that during her term as Supreme Court Justice, she will not be able to protect the privacy and safety of, of biological women today in America. Conservatives were uh, not surprisingly shocked at the answer. However, I read an article in the USA Today uh, that was typical kind of what you might see from the mainstream media. They too were furious at Judge Brown's answer, but for different reasons. The author of this article uh, expressed great fury and vitriol against Judge Jackson because she implied that biologists can actually identify a person's gender. And, and when you look up the definition online, inevitably you'll find something like this. And this is from the Cambridge English Dic Dictionary. It says, an adult fem a woman is an adult female human being. And of course, there's those that are clamoring to change this definition, but no one's been able to come up with an alternative. As a result, we read confusing headlines, how biological men are dominating women's sports. In addition to swimming, we've got track, we have skateboarding, found out about that last night, weightlifting with the Olympian, and particularly scary is that there was a, um, a biological man competing in uh, mixed martial arts, and, he, in, in, in this, this individual was cracking the skulls of women, putting them in the hospital. We also have uh, biological men being named Women of the Year. For instance, Rachel Levine, famously by USA Today. And we've got biological men winning awards as actresses. Uh, so from the, for, the purpose of in, for the purpose of the sermon, when I refer to a woman, I'm referring to an individual with two X chromosomes. As, as sad as it is to start off a, a, a sermon on Proverbs 31, you, you really do have to define what a woman is. And, and, I, and I'm not in any way trying to cast scorn or, or anything unloving on those that disagree with us. But it does, because we can't even def agree on the definition of woman, it just really highlights the amount of confusion that there is and the world today. 
Uh, there's perhaps one in 20,000 individuals born with genetic abnormalities, but they're classified as intersex, but they aren't the ones making the headlines. And so generally, it's XX or XY, simply put. There's a massive amount of controversy and confusion regarding what, co what constitutes a woman and then what men and women should be like. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn was censored by Facebook, taking down her post because she said biological men should not compete in women's sports. And so that simple statement was enough for Facebook to say that violates hate speech and our terms of service, and so they've taken her down. Uh, they're not allowing a, a sitting democratically elected state senator to defend the rights of biological women. Um, and then there's, it, it's gotten pretty bad with, uh, I don't know if you've been watching online, you've seen that the big tech censorship that's happening, it's been a big political issue. Um, there's things like called shadow banning where they might not ban someone outright, but uh, they'll restrict the, uh, the views on things. Um, we fall in that category. Uh, we have over 600 followers on Facebook, but the average is about, this last week, about 10 people or less saw our posts. So Facebook is working actively to restrict the access to our church, uh, as well as other places that don't toe the line. So, uh, this sermon itself, there's a high likelihood it'll be taken down. So you get to hear it. It's a treasure to be able to discuss God's word without fear of censorship in, in real time. So why do we talk about it if it's so controversial? Well, it illustrates what a godly woman is to look like. There are truths in Proverbs 31 that must be shared, and we can't shy away from discussion about controversial issues for fear of blowback or being called a bigot or intolerant or yelled at. I've already gotten a couple um, antagonistic comments on my Facebook page because I shared that there. Uh, so we need, to, we need to cut through the confusion and the chaos and bring clarity from God's word, giving us insight into how we should live in these contemporary times, particularly if you are a woman or a girl, what do you want to grow into? We need to hold up biblical models of man and womanhood so we can strive to honor the Lord and be the people he's created us to be. You can make the argument that nowhere in all of scripture is the picture of a godly woman more clearly presented than Proverbs 31. Often in Christian circles, we refer to godly women and role models as Proverbs 31 women. But what does that mean? That's what we're going to explore today. Um, single, married, whether single or married, whether man or woman, all of us can learn from and imitate the Proverbs 31 woman. And so you might be a single man here today, but you can learn things from the Proverbs 31 woman that we can, again, put in our life. Uh, Proverbs, the Proverbs 31 woman is essentially the embodiment of woman wisdom that's been discussed so often in the book. So uh, I invite you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 31, and let's examine this biblical model of womanhood and hold it up as an example for girls and women to learn from, for men to learn to appreciate, support, and encourage in, in the godly women in their lives. We desperately need Proverbs 31 women in our world today. And just looking out, of course I'm biased. I'm so thankful for the many Proverbs 31 women in this church the godly women that are here. Proverbs, as a review, is, is a collection of wise sayings, largely from King Solomon, compiled around 700 BC to impart practical, how do you live in an everyday life, um, and ethical, what we should or shouldn't do, and theological wisdom, how do we relate to God and for God's people, and ultimately to, to develop godly character. Uh, again, uh, Proverbs is, is overwhelmingly written by King Solomon, son of David, but we're not going to be looking at Proverbs, uh, Proverbs today written by King Solomon. It's important to remember that Hebrew poetry is full of allegory, figurative language, and parallelism, and so I'll try to preserve the parallelism on the screen just as it was in the original text, and so it just kind of gives you an idea of the poetry that the, that the uh, Hebrews were reading. So some of the slides might be a little off kilter. Uh, also, this is poetry. It's meant to give an artistic imp an impression of a godly woman. It's not to be taken literally in every facet, and I'm I'm, I could talk about this later, but I'm not sure that a, Proverbs 30, a literal Proverbs 31 woman has ever actually existed. So this just gives us a glimpse into what a godly woman is. So first we see a godly woman is heroic, and that she is rare, she's powerful, she's a model to be held up for all to see. And so uh, I was really excited to have my heroic wife 
uh, read Proverbs 31 and pray. And so, so appreciate you, Camila, and I might try to make you blush this sermon because I love you. We read in verse one, the sayings of King Lemuel, an inspired utterance his mother taught him. And she said, listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. And so I mentioned that Proverbs 31 is not written by King Solomon. It's written by King Lemuel. King Lemuel. Now, we don't know exactly who King Lemuel is. We can learn a little bit from his name. The name means belonging to God. There's no Jewish king's named Lemuel. And, uh, and so we're likely dealing with a God-fearing, non-Jewish king here. Sometime around the 5th to 10th century B.C. Now, it starts off in Proverbs 31 saying these are the utterances of King Lemuel, and there's no change in speaker throughout the entire chapter. And so I believe the best way to interpret the more famous section of Proverbs 31, 10 to, to 31, as a continuation of the utterances of King Lemuel and King Lemuel's mother. And there's also glimpses of, of why that is the case in the text itself. Uh, specifically, this chapter is an inspired utterance passed on to King Lemuel by the queen mother, by his mother, wanting to impart wisdom to her son. For what purpose? Being a king was, was tricky business. Uh, being in leadership today, it's really difficult. Being in leadership at any level, taking charge of anything, you open yourself up to criticism and, and competition and all those things. We think that being a king, at least, uh, uh, at least maybe some of us might think that being a king would be great. Anyone want to be king? No, we're all too smart to want to be king. Because there's so much on your plate, there's so much responsibility you're constantly under danger and under threat. That's why ancient kings were so often ruthless. They were often assassinated. And so here, Lemuel's mother wanted to impart wisdom to her son to help him govern. And, and, and King Lemuel recognized this wisdom and passed it along for others to hear and heed as well. Did you catch the way that, that Lemuel's mother addressed him? See the passion, see the love in this chapter. It's beautiful. Uh, she says, listen, my son. Think about a mother's love for her son. That, a little guy that popped out of her womb that she, she knew from before birth and she loves and want nothing but the best for him. Listen, my son, son of my womb, you're my blood, flesh and blood, you're of, of me. Listen, my son, listen, son of my wombs, listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. Lemuel's mother loved him. She was deeply passionate about his well-being. And so all the words in Proverbs 31 are meant to encourage, they're meant to affirm, they're meant to, to pass essential wisdom on to her, her young king son. That's a treasure of inspired instruction from a mother to a son, critically important still for us today. So what did, how did she begin this, uh, this wisdom? We see in verse three, do not spend your strength on women your vigor on those who run kings. Now I'll confess, when I was growing up and I wasn't always real happy with the fairer sex, and I might use this verse to say, ah, women, girls, or cooties, whatever, <clears throat> but that's not how we're to interpret this. It is a warning against women, but not women in general. There's a specific type of woman that the queen is warning her son about uh, those would only would view a king for his power, not for who he was as a person. Want to take advantage of them. Uh, they would view a king as an object to gain benefit from. Uh, the type of woman that would use their bodies to gain power, manipulate, uh, manipulate others. And, and so he's warning against a multitude of women, pursuing, spending your strength on a multitude of women. Um, Lemuel is not to spend his strength chasing after these women. He's to enter into a monogamous, loving relationship with a queen instead of gathering a harem. There's actually warnings we see in Deuteronomy against kings marrying more than one woman. And yet, throughout ancient times, it was a common practice to have a large group of wives. A case in point, this is very dangerous, case in point is King Solomon. Do you remember how many wives King Solomon had? 300 concubines. So that's good. But 700 wives... 
700 wives. That is, he spent all day, every day with, with one wife. He'd barely be able to get through them all in a couple years. Can you imagine how horrible that would be for them and for him? And so uh, <laughs> I just can't even imagine the honey-do list, right? From 700 wives. And then 300 concubines just simply used for physical pleasure. It's just so tragic. And tragically, they led King Solomon astray. He chose them and their idols over the Lord. And his kingdom suffered great brutality and bloodshed for hundreds of years because of it. A split, divided kingdom. And so as a warning against women, that's the first thing that the queen urges her son to know. That's not the only thing she warns him about. She says in verse 4, It is not for kings, Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine. Not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. This is a really good Baptist verse, right? And it's warning against, against the consumption of wine. But it's, it's saying a lot more than that. Wine would have been commonly drunk in those days, and that's, it was okay. But the kings was never turned to alcohol to solve their problems. There's an idea of habitual drinking in view. All the stress that a king would be under would be very tempting for him to turn to a substance to give him momentary psychological relief from all of the, the, the stress and challenges and fears that he goes through. And so she's warning against habitual drinking. Drinking is a crutch, especially with the aim of drinking to the point you forget laws or forget how to do your responsibilities. She's not talking about, okay, King Lemuel, you've got to be, you've, you've got to be abstinent from, from alcohol the rest of your life. Uh, she's saying, don't turn to it and rely upon it in such a way that you would fail to do your duties as king. And so it's saying any way that would inca- incapacitate him. You think about all the, all the responsibilities of a king. Uh, I, love, uh, I love how our, our, our system of government in the United States is at least supposed to work with the three branches of government and each one holding each other balances and checks, again, theoretically. You've got the legislative branch making the laws. You have the executive branch who's enforcing the laws. You've got the ju- judicial branch making sure that all the laws are applied fairly. A king was responsible for all three of those. And one of the key aspects of that king was saying that he must uh, uphold laws throughout all the land. He's got to make good laws. He has to enforce laws appropriately and make sure that, that no one in his kingdom is treated unfairly. So you've got you to go easy on the wine in order for that to happen. And you also have to avoid a harem. Uh, verse 6, the queen said, Let beer be those for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty. Remember their misery no more. So you can, those that are suffering can partake in alcohol, take the edge off their pain. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. So there's again a reinforcement of Lemuel to, King Lemuel to do his duty and enforce just laws justly throughout the whole land. And then, uh, here's where we move into the more famous part of, of Proverbs chapter 31. And this is, this is beautiful. Uh, this actually begins a, an acrostic in Hebrew. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 verses from verse 10 to 31. And every one of those verses begins with a unique uh, chronological letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And so this is the first, so it's kind of the ABCs, and, and you walk all that way. Um, you know, some of, those, some of those letters must have been hard, right? If you ever do that in the English language, you, you, you wonder about X or Z, right? This is going to be really pretty difficult. Um, but this is the beginning of a beautiful acrostic poem in, in Hebrew, and, and so it might, might appear a little bit out of order, and so as I walk through it, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but you should see on the screen. Okay, so verse 10. A wife of noble character who can find, she is worth far more than rubies. Any amens? Guys, I'm going to give you a chance to say amen during the sermon. You're going to earn some, burning, some brownie points, go home, you know. And so if you want to cash in on those rewards at home, you know, be quick with the amens, right? Okay. Let's try it again, all right, shall we? A wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. And the guys say amen. amen. All right, we're awake. That's good. Sometimes you just got to test things out a little bit. And I'm amazing I'm am- 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 that as well for sure. All right, so godly wives, they are heroes. Godly wives are heroes. Because the the word here, when it says noble wife, uh, noble is just one of those things that just falls drastically short of 
the passion in this word. Uh, the, the, the word noble could also be translated powerful, full of valor, full of strength. The Hebrews, eshet kael, that, well, that's the uh, helper suitable. We'll get there in a moment. But uh, well, that's actually different. Eshet kael is, uh, is the actual Hebrew for this verse. Uh, what might come to your mind, think about Deborah in Judges chapter four. So think about Deborah in, in Judges chapter four. A woman of great wisdom, who with courage and faith she led and judged the Israelite people. She was decisive. She was a leader. She was a prophet. She was a judge. And then she was a general, taking 10,000 Israelite men in, into battle against a vastly superior Canaanite army with chariots. And so she went in there as a warrior and a general. And the Lord granted them defeat a victory over the defeat of the Canaanites after 20 years of brutal oppression. Deborah was a woman of valor. She was a heroic woman. And that word here, again, should be translated heroic. Uh, the word is used also of another woman that we studied last year. And let's see if anyone can guess who it is. A noble woman. Ruth, thank you. So Ruth is, is mentioned, just listen how Ruth is talked about in Ruth uh, 3.11. This is Boaz talking to Ruth. He says, and now my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble or heroic character. Think about all that Ruth did. She provided for her mother-in-law. She, she cast off the idols of Chemosh and left her homeland. She clung to Yahweh. She moved to, to Jerusalem and or moved to Bethlehem and, and to Judah in honor of her deceased husband and her mother-in-law. And she, she clung to Yahweh. She, she then spurred Boaz to be the man he was supposed to, do, to be to fulfill his portion of the law. What bravery, what heroism do we have here? And so it's saying we need women to be like Ruth. We need women to be like Deborah. The statement here poses a question, who can find? And so you, you might think, you might feel, maybe the English expression, maybe one in a million. One in a million. I, I think what it was trying to say here isn't so much that they're that, they're that rare, because I, there's a lot of Proverbs 31 women in this room, uh, and so you can't say they're one in a million, but you have that appreciation as, as this woman is a rare jewel, a gift from God. To, to you, uh, to everyone that she knows. She's rare. Uh, she says she, that she's compared to precious jewels. Uh, today, in today's day and age, the most common associated jewel with women would be the engagement ring, fine jewelry. And if a man really values his girlfriend or he, he converts her to be a fiance by giving her an expensive wedding ring. Now, at the cheaper end of this, we're looking at about $1,000. In 2019, the average engagement ring cost about $6,000. are not we glad we got engaged earlier, right? <laughs> Before inflation hit in. But it, it, way back in the day, it used to be what? You remember the rule of thumb? How many months salary was it? Three, at least, at least two. But three, three months of salary, you're saying this woman is worthy. She's worth far more than this Pity old ring that I'm giving her. She's precious. In fact, it says here that she's worth far more than jewels. We, we, can't, the, we can't miss over this word far. She's worth far more than rubies. Uh, one, one translation that I read said, a, a truly good wife is the most precious treasure a man can find. Amen. There we go. All right, you guys are still awake. That's good. Remember, brownie points at stake. And blessed by the Lord is a man who is given a wife, Proverbs 18, 22. What do we have as, as husbands? I'll speak as a husband here. What do we have that's more valuable, more precious than our wives? Our wives must be prioritized and respected as they deserve to be respected. We need to see who they are and, and see, not, not take it for granted, but to see their noble and heroic character and remind them of their value. And so on your outline, I'm going to ask you to skip ahead to the challenge. I'm going to give you a tip here. 
think about who are the influential women in your life? Who are the influential, influential women in your life? So those that are still existing, think about uh, godly women. Uh, and if anyone comes to mind, write them down. Write her name down. You can write it down under the challenge. You can write it down under the question up here. Think about mothers, grandmothers, aunts, sisters, friends, daughters, influential godly women in your life, and there's going to be practical application about that. Uh, one real quick application is to praise God for them because they truly are far worth far more than, than jewels. Godly women are heroes. They're God's gifts to all humanity. They're to be respected, treasured, and held up as examples for all of us to follow. And again, uh, this is from Scripture. Uh, we see throughout Proverbs 31 that a godly woman is home-centered. We're immersed in, in a culture that is a starkly con- contrasting and confusing views of what a woman's role should be. So let's turn to Scripture for much needed clarity and sanity here. What does this woman do? What does this woman do? We find in, in verse 11 and 12, her husband has full confidence in her. He lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. So Proverbs 31, woman takes care of her husband. That's important to note, this is, this is talking about the kind of woman that King Lemuel should pursue. So it's really for, from one perspective, absolutely there's a partnership. The husband takes care of the wife, the wife takes care of the husband. Uh, but, but men, we need women to help take care of us, don't we? Uh, just Adam, case in point, was created, wasn't good, needed helper. And so a woman, a godly woman, is going to be a true partner with the husband. She takes care of him, looks after him. It's wholehearted trust in the relationship. She brings him good, not harm. Ladies, I've got a question for you. Have you ever wanted to harm your husband? Wait, don't, don't answer, don't answer. No, no raising your hands, no testimonies. Have you ever wanted to harm your husband? I'm, I'm sure my wife would say she's felt tempted. I'll speak for her, because I've done things that would, you know, deserve a little uh, retribution. But here we see a woman who's full of love and self-discipline, who does not give her husband what he deserves, never gives him harm. It's always good. Rick, I see that smile. You and me both, buddy, we're fortunate. As long as they both shall live. And so here we have a picture of a a godly, Proverbs 31, who's taking care of her husband and doing him good all the days of her life. How does she do that? Well, we see in verses 21 22, when it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She was clothed in fine linen and purple. And so here, she's keeping children and her husband well clothed. Scarlet would have been very expensive, would have been high quality, would have been the type of clothing that would keep you warm. Have you ever gone into the cold, like, Real cold, not Florida cold. Real cold, like single digits plus a wind chill. Have you ever been in that kind of environment without proper, without proper heavy-duty clothing? It's terrible. And in, in ancient times, that could give you frostbite, it could kill you. And so a, a, a good godly woman, wife, and mother is taking care of the husband and children by making good clothes for them. The heart of the wife and mother wants to make sure her family doesn't get sick or die from exposure to cold. And the home is well decorated, pleasant, got good bed sheets, uh, clothed in fine linen. Linen is made from plant, uh, made from flax. The plant purple was rare, is used in a dye from from shellfish to turn um, turn clothes purple. Uh, again, remember who we're talking about here. We're talking about a, a suitable wife for a king, and so you're talking about a, a noble woman or a woman of royalty who would have access to purple cloth. And so again, it's important to keep the context in mind here. This is, this is literally, I titled the sermon, A Wife Fit for a King, because that's really what Proverbs 31 is. It's talking about a wife fit for a king. Verse 23, her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. Doesn't that seem unfair? Is anyone with me on that one? 
You, you read Proverbs 31, you're like, a woman must do this, must do that, not, her, not harming the husband, she's making clothes, she's doing all these things. And where's the husband? He's just sitting around. That's right, Tom, thank you for your honesty. It's not, it's not, it, that's the wrong amen. That's the wrong amen. <laughs> so, but her husband is respected the city gate where he's taking a seat among the elders of the land. Well, what is he doing? Well, uh, here's actually a picture of a city gate. Uh, this is in the archaeological um, site over at Lachish. And so uh, thousands of years ago, there would have been an actual Jewish men sitting at the city gate. Uh, a gate was important because it, was, it controlled access into and out of the city, which would have been walled. And so it's a place where the, where the people would do business. It was a lot like the town hall. Uh, so they would have been really fulfilling the role of, of policemen and, and the governors and, and firemen. And anything that needed to, be, needed to be taken care of, these men would, would be doing their, their roles to protect the city and to, to act in, in the welfare of everything. And so he's a man of high esteem. And he's able to do that because he's not looking over his shoulder. Because his wife is trustworthy. Because he can delegate all the housework to his wife and know that they're not going to have a house, guys running around naked and starving. Because that's really what this is talking about. She's clothing him, she's feeding them, she's bringing the husband honor. He does not have to worry about home. He knows his wife has got it. We're going to skip to verse 27 here. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. So she is busy managing the house. And so she's, she's really the chief operating officer of the home with the children, what's going on in the house, while the husband is out there working and providing for the, for the family in other ways. This woman is not idle at home. Here's a picture of a, of a loom, uh, and this would have been uh, from, I think, about the 1800s. It's hard work to create cloth. Hard work. I've never done it, um, but uh, it, you would have had to weave in all these threads, and how is it you take a thread, how is it you create a thread, and then turn that thread into a blanket or turn it into to actual clothing? A woman's working hard. She's working really hard. She, she might not be seen out as much in, in public as much as the man, but she is hard at work not eating the, the bread of idleness at home. It doesn't mean that she doesn't kick back, relax, and enjoy herself and, and rest, but that's not the way of living for her. She's often working hard and unfortunately often underappreciated. 28, her, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. He says, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. And, and I, I read this, and I, I think that this picture pops into my mind, and, and just totally theoretical. Let's say you have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old boy at your house. Just theoretical. And I have this picture that, that every morning after a long, well, whatever night's rest we get, uh, after, after night's rest, and the nine-year-old and seven-year-old boy pop up and they come in and they say, you're blessed, mama, you're blessed. That's not what's being said here. So d- relax if you're a mother, you've never been told this by your young children before and certainly not every day. A, a better picture here is being honored by the household. Wise children grow up to recognize the sacrifices of their mothers. And how, how, how true is that in, in our lives? We look at the, the mothers that have worked so hard for our well-being that we can look back and say, you know what? God really blessed me with a godly mother. For those of us that have had the fortune of having godly mothers. Uh, for those of us that have been blessed with a godly mother, that's grace. Uh, for those of us that might not have had a godly mother, I might, I'm, I'm so deeply sorry for that. And that's why it's so important for us to raise up a generation of godly women, godly mothers, godly wives. That's why this sermon's so important. I want to set a, a standard for what a, a godly wife is supposed to look like. Her husband treasures her. That's so what he's saying is that her husband would take her over any other woman in the world. 
So here's where we get a little romantic, right? And it's true. You, you go through these things and I look at my wife and I'm like, you better stay alive a long time. And uh, just, just love and appreciate her f- so much. And, and this is the heart that we need to have as husbands toward our wives. Many women do noble things. Many women do heroic things. But you surpass them all. Eyes only for the wife. Um, you hate to say it, but I'm sure you're probably aware there's an, yet another huge scandal that hit the church this last week. And the Southern Baptist Convention released a list of hundreds of pastors who have uh, failed at home. We need godly men to have godly women. We need godly men who respect and cherish and honor their godly wives. So godly, Proverbs 31 woman is to be honored by the household of men. We can do better at affirming our lives. We need to do better at affirming our lives, our wives. So why does this woman do all this? I like to look at nature. The females have a complementary role to the males, but it's absolutely indispensable. If you consider the role of the lioness, one of my, one of my favorite hobbies is to watch nature documentaries. Educational, informative, fun. Uh, sometimes they're comedy, sometimes they're horror, whatever it may be. But what, it's, still, it's so fascinating to see uh, a, a pride of lions because you've got the, the big, majestic males with the massive manes, and their roars could be heard for miles. But you know what those males do most of the time? They sleep and eat. Tom, I've got to borrow you every weekend. You're, you're spot on. They sleep and eat, right? And, and, and who's doing all the work? The mommy, the lioness. So you, you look at it, it's like, these poor lionesses, they're like going out, they're, they're getting the gazelles, they're getting the zebras, they're getting the, the wildebeest, whatever it is, all these lionesses are working so hard, they're, they're going out, they get the kills, like 90% of the time it fails, but 10% of the time they succeed, and they bring that, they bring that, that kill back to, to their family, and who gets the first bite? Daddy. daddy gets the first bite, right? So you get to think that's really unfair, then daddy gets the bite, she gets the bite, and she shares with her cubs and looks after them. It's fascinating when you look at nature, the nurturing, hardworking character that females have to be fair to the male. He protects his cubs from getting eaten from other lions. He protects the territory so they've got room to eat and hunt. So let's not be too harsh on those males. They each have their complementary roles. I just still think it's a little unfair. God created, this is not supposed to be controversial, God created mothers. What a gift. Whether it be a mother lioness or a mother human. There's just, he, he created them, it's, it's so beautiful. Now physically, a human being can birth another human being. It's fascinating, it's a miracle. I've loved, I've loved when Camila's been pregnant. She hasn't loved it necessarily the whole time. But it's just amazing. You got this little being, a human being that's going around inside of her and it's just fascinating and to be able to, to see sonograms of what's going on and the little ones in there and, and all that. It's just wonderful and beautiful and praise God for it. And then that's just the beginning. They get a, a nine months head start getting to know that little child and then they, they nurse the children. Now, physically, God created them to be able to do that. And then they've got the bone structure to handle that. Their pelvis is larger for a particular reason. It's not accidental. And so they've got reproductive organs and all these things, and the womb is just that special physical place to carry children physically. And in biology, God gifted women with a special place, but it also is in the heart and the mind, the compassion of a mother, the tender love and affection of a mother towards her children, that nurturing spirit. There's a reason, and I don't know what the stats are, but maybe 95%, just some, some overwhelming percent when there's, a, when there's a, a divorce, who gets custody of the children? The mother does, because God has given mothers a unique heart, love, and compassion for the children. We need to honor that. That's how God created women to be. Nurturing, loving, kind, Genesis 2, going back, man alone is insufficient. The only 
thing that was not good about creation is that Adam was alone. And so God created a woman to complement, a woman to be a full reflection of the image of God. Isn't that interesting? There's masculine and feminine attributes of God that are only perfectly displayed when you have man and woman. And so indispensable, absolutely essential, both genders are. It's not good for man to be alone. Think about those guys' nights out. Mom goes off for, the, the ladies are talking about taking a, a well-deserved retreat to go be alone away from the children. I'm a little concerned about what the rice house might look like when Camila gets home. <laughs> Pizza boxes, wherever, blood, whatever, everything's a mess. God gifted us with women. God created women to keep us men in line. I love the, the, the Hebrew word, Ezer Kenigdov, a helper suitable, the missing puzzle piece. The one rare time that you could actually say, you complete me, would be an appropriate usage of a romantic line in Hollywood. A helper suitable, not to dominate or lead, but to be by his side as an indispensable teammate. Marriage is teamwork. In this Western mindset, we get so caught up in the individual roles and accolades and comparisons but we're each, both genders, to serve the family before God as best as we can. And it's a beautiful thing that God created a helper suitable for Adam. So the Proverbs 31 woman is home-centered, but really all of us should really be prioritizing our homes. What keeps us from investing into our families? Well, self-centeredness and pride. We start keeping score, things that we've done, things that we haven't done. This is what I deserve. And, and, and we want to do what we want to do because we deserve it. And so, so often all these conflicts can break out in families because of self-centeredness and pride. Uh, maybe we're just caught up in, caught up in busyness. We're not, we're not intentionally neglecting the family. We're just too busy with work, bills, chores, hobbies, and pursuits to make adequate time for them. It's kind of one of those things that certainly I, I, I have to keep fighting against. That's one reason why I've really loved reading through a proverb a day the month of May. It's because we've made deliberate time to sit down as a family around God's word and talk about what it means to be wise. We're raising godly young men who know his word. And please pray for, please pray for us in that. Anyone with a child knows it's only by the grace of the Lord that we're able to raise godly families. But we, we can't allow the busyness of life to prevent us from being the mentoring mothers and fathers that he's called us to be. We misplace priorities. Be, be really consumed with personal freedom or liberty or happiness. You know what our top priority in, in life is? What did God leave us here to do? Make disciples. Make disciples. That's why he didn't just take us to be with him when we die. What's the best place, the most which should theoretically be the easiest place to make disciples, the home. In fact, if we're not making disciples in our home, what are we doing? And so this is our top priority. Uh, I've seen this happen with many other pastors where they invest so much into ministry and other people, and you've seen it with, with guys in business or even women in business. They invest so much into their work that they raise generations of well-fed, well-clothed youths who want nothing to do with God, church, or the Bible. We've got to keep our priorities straight. That I will be a failure as a person, even if I succeed as a pastor, if my, my, my boys don't grow up to love the Lord. And, and that's, if that's my responsibility, if I didn't make time for them, didn't prioritize their discipleship. Uh, another, another thing that will keep us from following the good example of Proverbs 31 woman being home-centered is people-pleasing. Uh, where we just give the children what they want not what they need, to be their friend, not their father, or their friend, not their mother. So we need to be very careful to put their needs over our need to feel appreciated. Because that's going to be, that, that, that desire to, to feel the applause of the children, oh, you're a great mom, you're a great dad, that, that, that need for applause is going to be there. We cannot allow that to drive our disciple making of our children. God has gifted women with beautiful nurturing hearts in order to fulfill 
a critically important role to look after the well-being of their husbands and children to make disciples. If they're not looking after the home, who will? The government, right? Don't trust the government with your children. Godly women are heroic, they're home-centered, they're, they're also hard-working. Picking up in verse 13, she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. And so here again, we've got making clothes. What I really like is, is, is the word is translated, she works with eager hands. She does not curse under her breath as she's making the clothes. She's eager. She takes delight in. She's pleased to serve. She, she's doing these things out of love, not, of, not out of compulsion. She is a jewel. One of the things we have to really watch out for in Proverbs 31 is this is not a to-do list. This is the natural outflow of a woman who loves the Lord and has had a heart transformed by the Lord. And so she's making clothes. She's working hard. In verse 14, she's like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. I tested that on Camille this morning. I said, sweetie, you're like a merchant ship. She didn't gush. She wasn't all proud and excited. But what it's saying here is uh, this Proverbs 31 woman is like a merchant ship bringing food from afar. She's gathering food. She's bringing delicious, healthy, good food, good value, making sure that there's, nu- there's a balance of nutrition. And so that's what she's doing, getting all the different food groups. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. And so here you've got this idea where she's cooking for the family. So she's gathering the food. She's cooking the food. If she's got to get up early in the morning to do that, she does that. And she's working very hard to, to gather the food and, and cook for the food. Uh, I've never made bread from scratch, but I don't think it's easy. A lot of mixing, a lot of muscle involved. And to do that regularly, bread would have been a staple in those days in ancient times. So she's, she's very eager to work and provide for her family. Not just her family, but also her maidservants. Again, we're talking about a woman of nobility, a woman of wealth and of means. She's cooking for her family. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. This is interesting. In fact, most of the things here you see in Proverbs 31, or I should say many of the things, would have been illegal for a Hebrew woman to do. And so again, we're talking about a a pagan culture. We're talking about an ideal situation. Uh, Buying and selling a field was not something normally a woman could do. Uh, But yet she's, she's evaluating the field. She's planting a vineyard. She's busy. Is she doing this from home? Is she confined to her home? She is not. And so she's not the picture of maybe a traditional homemaker that we might have been grown up thinking of. She's, she's busy. She's, she's a working woman, this Proverbs 31 woman is. Verse 17, she sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. That's kind of a scary thought. The lamp does not go out at night. Does this mean that she, she's an insomniac? She never sleeps? No. What it's saying is, is an expression. You know, burning the candle at both ends. You think about it. Who do you, who do you go to if you're a child and you, you're not feeling too good at night? Do you go to dad? Do you wake up dad? No, you do not. You wake up mama because she's going to look after you and nurture and care for. She's quick. You know, I, I was awesome when Matthew, actually Matthew, when he still cries, Camille's still first up to get him. But it's just a beautiful way that the, the mother takes care of, she wants, she's eager to look after the needs of her family. And if it's the middle of the night, she's more concerned about the well-being of her family than even her own sleep. Her lamp does not literally burn all night, but figuratively it does. And she trades at the market. So she's buying and she's selling. Verse 19, in her, ha- in her hand she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes or belts. And so she's working really hard. Um, and so she's got the picture of the spindle and the distaff and, and you've got the yarn of thread. This is a 4th century BC uh, Greek painting from uh, a jug up there on the screen. They could see how she's creating 
these, uh, these clothes. What does it look like today? Well, here's just an idea of what it looks like today. Nursing children, preparing food, cooking, doing all these things, making grocery runs, cleaning, doing the laundry. Thankfully, we don't have to do make clothes today, although some women do like to do that. And then also being out in the marketplace. And so if you were to make a direct one-to-one comparison as much as possible between a 1000 BC, ancient Near Eastern, Proverbs 31 woman, and what's today, this is just some things that, might, that a modern woman might look like. Is it saying that a woman has to do these things in order to be considered a Proverbs 31 woman? No. Uh, but this is just kind of an idea and when you really begin to think about it, think about all the work that goes into a homeschooling mom or just mom, being a mother in general, there's a lot of work that's there. Women today work very hard, both in the home and out of the home, often in thankless roles, yet they are indispensable to the health of their families. And beyond that, to their churches, their society in general, their communities. They're hardworking. They're full of heart. In verse 20, and then 25 and 26, it says this. She opens her arms to the poor. She extends her hands to the needy. She's clothed with strength and dignity. And she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. What does that mean? I mean, she's generous. She's opening up her arms to the poor and to the needy. And she's not doing it because she feels like she has to. She's doing it because she's compassionate. She has a compassionate heart. Uh, It says it's like her clothes or or strength and dignity. The first thing that you see when you see a Proverbs 31 woman is you see strength and dignity just covers her. I think it's amazing when you get to know somebody and you get to know their their character and you, you start to see the beauty of their nature coming out and this is the picture we have of a, of a Proverbs 31 woman. Now, she doesn't literally laugh at the days to come. That's kind of a strange expression. What's saying is she tr- she's trusting. She trusts the Lord. She's not anxious about tomorrow. She's not fretting. She knows that she has done everything that she can do and she's trusting the Lord with tomorrow. Now, have, you, and, and have you ever been in a situation where maybe as a child, you're all worried and anxious about something? Something, something that maybe, what, what, what's tomorrow gonna bring? Am I gonna be able to eat tomorrow? Uh, am I gonna be sick? You know, as an example, I'd get white spots on my skin on occasion when I was, when I was a kid, and you know, just part of growing. And I, I thought that I had leprosy. <laughs> and thankfully, yes, we can laugh at that, right? And so I, I would take that concern to mom and, and she'd just, she just laugh. She's like, oh, honey, you're fine. And she would diffuse the, ang- the anxiousness and the worry. She's laughing at the days to come. She trusts the Lord. She's not worried. She's not all tied up and nervous. It's a Proverbs 31 woman. She's wise. And praise God that it says that she, she opens her lips with wisdom because she's not just wise, but she is sharing that wisdom. It's really important for us to create avenues to listen to wise women. Uh, as Rick got me in trouble a few weeks ago, and he's talking about when women are talking, there's a meaning behind what they're saying, and listen to that meaning. And so thank you, Rick, for getting me lectured at home because I'm not always good at that. So, to listen to, encourage what these women, what these wise women have to say. And they're loving, compassionate, and caring. So the million dollar question is, how can we cultivate this kind of character? How can we cultivate this type of character. Proverbs 31 is not a to-do list, but so often within churches, it's used as a to-do list. You know, this woman, we, we set her on a pedestal, oh, that's a real Proverbs 31 woman, but this woman over here, not so much. And we can be very judgmental towards one another. It's not about working super hard. It's not just a matter of, of keeping the lamp burning all night. There's something much deeper to it. We must rely upon the Holy Spirit for transformation of the heart. And so it's very important if you're a woman here today to pray for transformative experiences in your heart to 
become more and more like this woman. And again, I don't think that the Proverbs 31 woman has ever existed because if you just take it literally at face value, no woman would be able to do all these things and then also keep the lamp burning all night. It just, you just can't. It's poetry. And so instead of using, using this as a to-do list or, or something to judge each other on, we just rely upon the Holy Spirit. And here's a really important word. We must embrace grace. Understanding this is an aspirational list, something we aspire to, you inspire to as women, to not look at this and judge yourself because you don't feel like you're, you're lining up here or there. So embrace the grace of the Lord and ask him and his Holy Spirit to empower you to be this type of woman. The heart of a godly woman is transformative to all those around her. Her heart is a prized treasure that is full of God's love and she brings life to all those around her. What a beautiful heart that she has. She's also honorable. We pick these last two verses of the book of Proverbs. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Well, a little confession here. I don't really like the NIV translation here, so I want to share with you my favorite translation of Proverbs 31, uh, verse 30. It's the DCT version. Anyone familiar with the DCT version? Uh, when you read it, maybe you're familiar with it. It says, uh, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. A woman who fears the Lord, she ain't playing. Have you guys heard that before? No? We got any Gen Xers here? Did anyone? Oh, you guys are missing out. This is off of an early album of DC Talk. Thank you. Yes, you got it now. All right, good. We're still awake. That's, that's good. And so uh, I, I, I would sing this and pray that one day God would bring me a wonderful God, the Proverbs 31 woman, and he did. So it's very exciting. I serenaded Camille this morning. She never heard this song before, so I serenaded her, and she was very impressed. So guys, if you want to earn brownie points with your wife, uh, memorize the lyrics and rap them to her. Um, but only if you're a good rapper. Um, no such thing. <laughs> um, if, you, if you're still not familiar with DC Talk, you know Toby Mac. Toby Mac is, he's there in the, he's got the, the fanny pack in the middle and the plaid shorts. But I actually do really like this, I really do like this translation because the word uh, charm is deceitful, beauty is, is vain. Think of the word vanity. You hear that elsewhere in scripture? Vanity, vanity, all is Vanity. The book of Ecclesiastes is saying that charm is deceitful, that there might be a way of a woman who's very full of charisma and she's uh, just full of personality and she's talkative and, and all that, and, but that can be deceitful. That can be good or bad. And then beauty. Beauty is vanity. It is. Beauty is one of those things, and the picture from Ecclesiastes is, is that of someone who's picking up sand in their hands and it just flows right through your hands, you can't grasp it. You can't grasp at the wind. And so beauty is here one minute and it's gone the next, at least physical beauty. What is our culture prize today? Charismatic, beautiful women. That's just put on the, on, on, the, on the pedestal, the actresses. Our culture puts these incredible pressures on women to, to be a certain way, to be enthusiastic, to be witty, to be funny, to be the life of the party, and to, to dress a certain way, look a certain way, to get these guys. That's deceitful. That's vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she is not playing around. She's to be praised. She's to be praised. The heart of the Proverbs 31 woman, it's not charm, not beauty. It's fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord. And I'm so excited that we've had this theme going all throughout Proverbs. Fear the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. It's not simply reverential awe. There's no word in English that I could think about that's strong enough. When you fear the Lord, what that does is, is that we see God's word and we, 
We bend the knee to it. We submit to it. Whatever it says, we obey. We orient our entire lives around God's word, God and his commands. And, and the thought of us allowing sin to separate us from him, it is a fearful thought. We cling to him as he is our life, our grace, our mercy, our future, our hope. Our eternity is bound up in him. We are in his hands. He's the one that is causing our heart to pump blood right now and filling our our lungs with air. We're to fear him, to follow him, to serve him, obey him, to live for him. That is fearing the Lord. It's not simply having a deep respect for him. I fall so far short of what's meant here. And that's the beating heart of a Proverbs 31 woman. That she subjugates any perceived right she might have and say, this is what God's word says, I'm gonna live accordingly. No matter what pressures I get from the culture, this is what I'm gonna do. This is what I'm gonna follow. And a heart like that deserves honor. It deserves trust. It deserves praise. A great tragedy, especially in the church, is that so often Proverbs 31 women get scorned from both sides. From, the, from those that might be very traditional, legalistic, conservative, that look at a woman, check, there's a checklist, Proverbs 31, and you might, be, you might have one woman who partially qualifies as a Proverbs 31 woman, and the rest of them get judged. The flip side is that the, the, the heart that God has created women with is dismissed, receives scorn, that somehow slavery is taught from scripture, but that's not slavery, that's freedom. To be who God has created us to be is true freedom. The heart of the Proverbs 31 woman is honorable, so how can we honor godly women today? Well, there's many ways we can do that, and I just wanna walk through Gary Chapman's five love languages real quick. Words of affirmation to recognize, to give thanks to these women, to speak words of encouragement to them, to to let them know that their hard work is appreciated and that they are loved, what they're doing is worth it. And so words of affirmation would be great to give to godly women. Acts of service, Uh, maybe do some of the things that she does all the time. Give her a break. Do the dishes, do the laundry, do those things. Do whatever it is that she does. Step in, and I hear some women I'm there. Step in and do some service for her. Free her up. Another thing is to give gifts. Buy something special for her. It's a reminder of how much she means to you. Maybe create something, something that she likes that shows that you know who she is. Give gifts. Spend quality time Devote time specifically engaging in conversation, asking thoughtful questions and listening, sharing in vulnerability, demonstrating trust. And the fifth from Gary Chapman is a physical touch. So hugs, pats on the back, kisses if you're in a romantic relationship, cuddling. Um, Maybe if it's a woman that's not in romantic relationship with you, get her a massage or something. And so these are ways that we can show, we can honor women in our lives. We are commanded by God's word to honor Proverbs 31 women in our lives. We must recognize their hard work in private and in public and encourage their hearts. And as I'm I'm reading this, I'm really thinking that that I need need to do a better job. We need to do a better job at at lifting up the godly women and and saying how much we appreciate and encourage them. And uh, just really, that more than anything, I really want to be the takeaway. The takeaway for this is not if you're a woman in here, compare yourself to, to the list because you're not going to compare perfectly. The, the, the takeaway here is who are the godly women in your life and then do something for them. Encourage them. Tell them to stay strong. Honor them. Encourage them. So who will you honor this week and how? Think about these things. And then I would encourage you to write that down on your, on your outline. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we can't not thank you enough for the godly women in here. We cannot thank you enough for the many godly grandmothers, the godly mothers, aunts, sisters, daughters, friends. What a treasure that women are. What a gift they are to us. 
what a gift they are to our families, to our communities, to our churches. They truly are beyond anything that we could ever expect or, or deserve. Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you'd fill them with, with courage, with valor, with strength to be the heroic and noble women that you've called them to be. That you'd be with them, that you'd help, that you'd fix our homes, that our homes would be centered around you and around your word. Places of a disciple-making factory, these young ones being taught to grow up in the Lord, to follow you, to serve you. Lord, strengthen the hands of our women. They can work, they can work hard, but Lord, that, that you give them the strength to continue and to do so with a joyful heart, knowing they're doing exactly what you created them to do, being the people that you called them to be. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their hearts, continue to give them compassion and tender care for others, to not be discouraged by the controversies in the world or the pressures they might feel in the world. Lord, and help us to honor them. Lord, I pray that you would help us to honor the godly women. You put women on our hearts that we're to honor and show us how we can do that. And Lord, above all, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to change our hearts, to convict us and strengthen us to be the people that you've called us to be. And praise in Jesus' name, amen.